Yeah, 40 people are like, yeah, okay. <laughs> I got it, man. Um, so, hey, uh, good morning and good afternoon, good evening, wherever you guys are. Um, lovely to see your faces. I see so many of my friends. Becco, Mina, Michelle, Miss Kennedy, Cynthia, Suzanne, Maddie. I see all you guys, Ronald, Dominique, Lorena, Paula, Betta, Nicole, Emily. Yeah, I see everybody in the house, guys. Francisca, good to see you. So everybody's here uh, that's supposed to be here. Claire, Heather, Ute, Meg, Sweet, Court. All right, Doris, okay. There's, and, and if I missed, uh, hey, Mark, if I missed you, just because there's so many little squares and, you know, sometimes, Selvin, hey, sometimes it's hard to see these little jams. Okay, so guys, let's jump into, let's jump into our work today. So today's conversation is on finances, building your business. I wanted to do something, I wanted to have a mind science on something a little more practical today. Um, I, well, I mean, everything's practical in some way, in other words, practically applied, but this is, of, you know, obviously very practical in the sense of it being a little less philosophical, uh, a little less esoteric, uh, interpretive, and, and more straightforward conversation. Mathematics, of course, tends to be more uh, linear and you know, finances, in my, you know, there, there is, of course, room within the discussion of wealth uh, for interpretation, philosophy, personal perspective, approach. Um, but there are some, you know, there are some um, formulas, strategies that, you know, I particularly believe in and have used, and uh, I'd like to sort of, you know, uh, unpack some of those today, discuss them, and how that relates to building your business, and hopefully we can open up this as a conversation with us all, so, you know, as questions come up, let's feel free to ask them, let's, you know, let's make this a dialogue, because you may have an individual question about approach for you, and that's going to be a little different than someone else. First of all, let me tell you very briefly, if you'll uh, be patient for a moment, let me tell you my financial story so that you have a little bit of context to work with. And it, it, it's, it's, not too, uh, it's not too long. It's, very, it's actually quite simple. <coughs> so it goes like this. Uh, grew up in a household. Parents were not financially well-educated. They were not wealthy, and they did not have uh, parents who had educated them in terms of wealth management or wealth accumulation. So uh, it was not a conversation in my house, money. We never talked about it in, 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 in the sense of education. It was more, you know, you get, you know, you, you get a job and you keep a job and you do well at your job. You know, you work hard, but in terms of how to manage wealth, never discussed it, never came up. Uh, my mom and dad were middle class, um, and I'd say that we were, uh, we were not in the upper middle class, maybe that would have been the case had there only been one child in my family. But my dad had two children from his previous marriage because my mom and dad had divorced and then remarried. So my, my current mother and father have been together for, I don't know, 30 something years, but they, 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 are, they came from two separate marriages. So it's my stepdad and my mom. And that's who I grew up with. So, and, and I can say the same thing about my biological father never discussed wealth, 
had the same job for like, you know, for, for 35 years, retired from that job, but never had a conversation about money. Um, but anyway, we, th- my, my stepfather had two kids from his previous marriage. My mom, she had three, so it was five children. Um, we had a, you know, middle class life. Um, as I said, it might have been different had there only been one child, and you could have sort of concentrated your wealth there. But you had to spread it amongst five kids and, and all the things that that meant. So uh, we certainly did not suffer uh, financially, but never, nothing excessive, nothing, nothing, you know, we, you know, we, we were definitely not on the higher end of that. So I didn't know anything about money. I didn't have a family that discussed money. We didn't come from money. As a matter of fact, when it was time for college, it was not even, you know, uh, there was n- no, there was obviously not even a uh, possibility of my parents putting any of us through college. They certainly didn't have enough wealth to support university. In America, we all know that that is, uh, that's a, an expensive experience. In, in Europe, oftentimes, you know, university is something that's uh, there for you uh, and part of your uh, citizenship in, in certain ways. Uh, but in the United States, uh, the higher education system, the university system, is uh, privatized, and so it's very expensive. My daughter's looking at college right now. The average college is between fifty and seventy thousand dollars a year, and I mean that's just all day long. That's not special college. That's not that's not anything. That's the the normal uh, you know college experience right now is is fifty seventy thousand. So uh, we'll, get into, we'll get into student debt later <laughs> or, or accumulating debt because that's its own special conversation. So parents couldn't afford to send me to college. Um, I was not academically talented enough. I was, a matter of fact, I was a terrible student. I was, a, I, was a, I was an absolute nightmare of a student. All I wanted to do was play sports, and and I was also an artist. I was on this school newspaper. Uh, I, 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 I was a graphic artist. I grew up actually as an artist. I was going to be a, a design artist first before, because I, I was, you know, sort of, I, 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 my inclination was in the direction, my natural, my natural skill was in the na- direction of movement and art. I just chose movement because for whatever reason, that's, th- those doors opened for me. So, uh, and I think that's interesting too. I wanted, I wanted, let me, side note. Sometimes people are like, man, what's my purpose? What's my, how do I find my purpose? I would argue that your purpose is self-evident and it's always been self-evident. It's whatever you're naturally gifted at. It, it's whatever comes natural to you, quickly, easily, and it's just something, I mean, again, mathematics comes naturally to some people so easily, it's just, it's just there for you with minimal effort. I don't know why you would try to become anything that doesn't come natural, and again, I'm not talking about simply choosing something because it's easy, I'm talking about choosing something because you have a gift in that direction. And, and again, that word gift, I know it, it could be interpreted many ways, but let's just say that since some people are gifted at this and some people are gifted at that, we're going to call it a gift. Nature has gifted you with an understanding uh, for you know, particular things. So mine is the observation of things. As an artist, one of the things that you, you have to be keen on is the ability to, to witness, to observe, to watch. Um, as an example, if I'm going to draw something, I have to be able to look at something over here and then recreate it over there. So I have to concentrate very, very um, very hard on what this, on the details of what this 
object is to recreate this object over here. So that has served me well in movement because I can watch a person move and I can see. I can also watch people's faces and their expressions when I'm doing personal, like what we call mind science work with them. And I can also see changes and listen. I'm, I'm just, an, you know, I can listen. And so it's just, that comes natural to me. I've always been able to do it. And it's become an asset, a skill that I've just uh, polished over the course of time. So coming back to wealth, that was just like, you know, a little side note of, of what, whatever you're, you know, whatever you're like, gosh, I just don't know what I'm going to be when I grow up. Be whatever you're good at. I know that sounds like an oversimplification, but it's not. Be what you're good at. Don't try to be what you're not good at. And that is an incredibly important, uh, I think, uh, strategy for life. Because have you ever met someone who plays the guitar and sings and they're like, I'm going to be you know, a successful musician or a musical artist and, and, and they don't play well and they don't sing well. And you're like, gosh, I just don't think, and inside your head, you're like, I don't think that's going to happen. But, in it, but on the outside, you're like, oh my God, you're doing so great, Barbara. Keep doing that. Why in the fuck do we say that to people? <clears throat> you know what I mean? Why do we look at people and tell them to do shit that we can clearly tell they don't do well? And we should, you know, I'd be like, no, you should do that as a passion. It's fun that you, I'm so happy that you enjoy the guitar. Uh, but as, as we say, oftentimes jokingly, don't quit your day job. Well, literally, don't quit your day job. Know what you're gifted at, my friends. Know what you're gifted at. And people will tell you what you're gifted at. They will. You'll get feedback from the time you're a kid to an adult. You'll get feedback. Someone will say to you, wow, you're good at that. Wow, you've got a, oh wow, you've got a talent for that. Wow, that, that's, that's impressive. It will come natural to you. So stop trying to do shit that you're just not gifted at. And in doing so, you're wasting your time. When, when, when you, when, in all honesty, and, and again, you may say this sounds pessimistic, but I'm going to say it's, it's realistic. The time you spend trying to become mediocre at a, at, at a craft that someone can do naturally quickly, you could be putting it into your natural gift quickly and becoming excellent. You see the difference? You could be excellent at your natural gift quickly, or you could be average at something you're not good at at all. Why the fuck would you do that? Why, why, why waste your time? But then a lot of people, well, I don't want to do, I, I, a great story. Well, I think it's a great story. <laughs> Had a friend, professional basketball player, NBA, professional basketball player, right? These guys make a lot of money. He's doing very well. Incredible. He was born, I, I've told this story before, I can't remember if, if I've told it here, but any of you guys have heard it. He's 6'11", okay? Six feet 11. He, his father was a professional NBA player. His brother and he went to college. They became NBA players. He's playing for a major NBA team. And he, I become his movement coach. This is one of my first, actually one of my first jobs as a movement coach for a professional athlete. We become friends. And he, the entire time, you know, as we become friends, he starts revealing something, which is he doesn't like playing basketball. Okay? He hates it. He does not like his gift. And... This is the power of manifestation. Before you know it, within, I, I mean, 
it, it had to be within three or four years. It was not a long period of time. He was traded from the team. He lost his job. His, just his lack of passion. He lost his job. He hurt his ankle. He went blah, blah, blah. No, but all things that he recovered from, but, but you know, nothing permanent. But all this stuff happened. And then he ends up going to play for these minor leagues in Europe, in Spain. And then inevitably, he ends up, and this, this, is, this is not a lie. This is not, a, not, for, not for theater, <laughs> this, this, this last part. The last time I saw him, he was selling knives in a pyramid scheme, like one of these Cutco company, like a company you sell knives. Like it's what college kids do when they, uh, it's, it's a cutlery company. He came over to my house and sold me a set of knives. This is an NBA basketball player. He was making, he was making $200,000 surely a year. He was killing it. He was young, he was just out of college. And then the last thing, the last time I saw him, he was selling me a set of steak knives for company. That is the power of manifestation. When you don't like your gift and you reject it, don't worry, it'll go away. And then you can try sucking at the things you already suck at. And then enjoy that experience for a while. So. Uh, you better learn, and this is, this is something I just think is interesting, you better learn to love what you're gifted at. I, I mean, I, I have several talents, as I said before. You know, art is one of my talents. I love to write. You can probably tell that just by the fact that I, I love um, to, uh, to uh, teach and, and, and have conversation on subject matter that's, that I find really interesting. So I also love to write. So let's put it this way. I could be an author. I could be, uh, you know, I, I play music. I, I, could be, uh, I could be a musician. I could be a rock star. I could be blah, 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 blah. But the, the reality is my greatest gift lies in me as a teacher. But do you think that that is every day what I want to do when I wake up? You think every day I want to wake up and fucking teach? You know what I mean? Do you think, does that, do you think every day like that, like you, you don't think I've ever sat and had, and had moments where I daydreamed about being something else, doing something else with my, with myself. But the reality is that I can do any of those other things as passion projects anytime I want. And I can continue to be grateful and focused on my natural gift and my craft and I can shut the fuck up and stop complaining inside my head. And I can chop the wood and carry the water and put a smile on my face and build my beautiful life. And, and this is what I find so, dis, so disturbing about the, you know, about the human mind, especially in a world that we live in now, is we have so many options only, we're so privileged at this point that we have so many options. We're like, well, I just don't know what I'm going to be when I grow up. What am I going to be? I love that when, I love when people say that kind of shit. What am I going to be? I'm like, it's not what you're going to be. It's what you are gifted at. Y you know, you think to yourself, there, there are certain things you can be because there's, a certain level of common education. Let's say you, you, you want to be a nurse. Well, pretty much anyone with a decent intellect can be a nurse. The education is fairly straightforward. It's, you know, anyone who is, you know, a decent problem solver can be a nurse. However, what makes a great nurse an extraordinary nurse versus an average nurse. Well, it's the passion you have for people, clearly. It's the passion you have to make a difference. It's the passion you have to walk in and make that person who feels sick, who's, who's ill, it's the passion you have for caring for them. That's what, that's what people are gonna remember. They're not gonna know what, what how, they're not gonna really know behind the scenes how skillful, skillful you were at 
nursing unless you kill them, <laughs> of course. But if you, just, if you just do the average expected work of nursing, everybody's the same. The difference is how you show up for people. Like, do you really fucking love caring for sick people, ill people, people in distress? Do you love it? And that's what your gift, that's how you, so, so again, there's certain things we can all be, because again, we can't all be an, a Picasso, because that's a very specific talent. But if you don't think that there were other painters out there, there were also, I mean, you know, Picasso began as a realist, and he was a very, very good realist, but he wasn't the best realist. There were many good painters. Picasso actually became famous for rejection, his rejection of realism and his embracing of impressionism, which for most artists at that time, they thought he was painting bullshit, <laughs> right? They thought he was painting complete bullshit. They were like, what the fuck is this? This is garbage. They thought his work was garbage. Picasso was not immediately famous. He was only recognized once people were able to understand his level of skill and the fact that he was diverting that into a completely un unexplored medium or a way of expressing his work within the medium at least. So. You have to be working in the direction of your gifts, number one, if you want to accumulate wealth. Because wealth comes without effort. And I, I'm talking about, I'm using that, I'm going to say this, you know, in a, uh, a loose way. That you, so don't, you know, don't try to be too specific when you interpret this, but wealth is attracted to a sort of effortlessness in, in, in someone's. So what you do in this effortless way, in, in a way, what whatever, whatever you naturally do, it, it will attract wealth. Because you'll, you'll be doing what you do, people will be wanting to pay you to do what you do well, and wealth accumulates. That doesn't mean you manage it well, that just simply means you have the ability to attract it. So stage one of attracting wealth is do what you're good at. Stage one, <clears throat> step one, do what you are good at. And <clears throat> uh, uh, see, someone said, uh, uh, someone said uh, it doesn't matter if you love all little things you can do. Uh, but it, but it doesn't matter if you love all the little things you can do. I'm not sure if this what this, but you 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 know you should love all the things you do, guys. I mean, again, you can love all your passions, and you can love all the things that. And it, it doesn't mean don't do the things that uh, are your hobbies. And sometimes you're so gifted at your hobby that your hobby uh, can also then become. Uh, another you know stream of, of revenue and wealth for you that's po you know you can be talented at more than one thing as well okay <clears throat> but my argument here is that it's going to be very difficult for you to attract wealth doing something that you're average at that's my argument why would someone pay you to be average when they can pay someone else to be extraordinary? It's a question. Why would someone pay you to be average when they can pay someone else to be extraordinary? So that's my line of thought, at least. Stage one. So stage two, <clears throat> you know, coming back to my original story of my personal, uh, my personal uh, wealth development because I didn't go to college, right? And I did not have a formal education. Basically, I left home 
in search of myself and my, you know, my future, my craft, what am I going to be when I grow up? So I, I, I left North Carolina and I went to Los Angeles. I figured I would put myself somewhere where anything was possible. I had some of my friends relocate there. Uh, they were musicians, and that's what they were working towards. And, uh, and I've always been around friends and people who, um, who are ambitious and working hard. So, uh, and, and both of my friends, uh, all, well, actually, actually, all three of them became successful musicians. Um, so, you know, putting yourself around other people who are equally ambitious and, uh, you know, have a, have a work ethic, I think also plays an important role in your life. Look at your, look at who is around you. Look at, you know, really, really be critical about it. Notice who do you spend your time with because whoever you spend your time with, you tend to become in some way, shape, or form. And I think that's very important to understand. Whoever you spend your time with, you in some way become this individual, and I say become them, you, you begin to share values and qualities and, and um, maybe ethics and morals. So you really have to take inventory of who you surround yourself with. So I've always surrounded myself with ambitious people, period. I surround myself with ambitious people because I like ambitious people. I like people that are hungry to create things and interested to, to produce and, and, you know, that, so again, that's, that's me. So I moved to LA <clears throat> and, you know, I'm, at this point, I'm doing something very, you know, very basic. I'm going back to North Carolina and I'm painting houses because because I'm a uh, I'm an artist, I'm pretty good at painting. So I figure out a way to make some money. I'm painting houses. So I go back, I paint houses, I make some money, I go back to LA and I survive with that money in LA from the painting of the homes. So I you know, I go back, I save up some money and I boom. <clears throat> and this is how I survive in LA as I'm building myself in the direction of, you know, teaching movement um, through martial arts and, you know, yoga and, and w the ways that I'm doing it. <clears throat> and I, of course, it's, it, it, if you follow some of my work, you know that, you know, one of my first roles I land is working with, you know, some celebrities and then I end up working on a, a, a film, um, uh, rush hour uh, movie, so I, I'm 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 creating these jobs, but they're far and few between, and they're not <clears throat> enough to sustain, you know, anything long term. So I'm I'm still you know I'm hustling, I'm hustling, and 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 I'm not making again any wealth that that could be saved. So at this point, um, you know, I've cut forward. I start figuring out, well, and, and let me just hold. Do, you have to do whatever it takes to make your wealth. You know, it, it, you, you have to be willing to hustle. You cannot be too good for a job. You cannot be too good for, you know, I slept on the floor behind my friend's couch for two years in LA while I uh, did this, all this stuff, um, I was, you know, I was never too proud. You can never be too proud. You, you work your ass off, because if you know you're great at something, you know, everything's temporary. That couch floor, that floor <laughs> was temporary, and I knew it was temporary, but <clears throat> I was not afraid to do the work. Don't be, don't ever be too good to take work, to do whatever it takes. If you know your, if you know your, ooh, if you know your skill, then you can lean into it. Like lean into knowing that you're headed in the direction of being extraordinary. 
So that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll clean the floor. I'll do the dishes. I'll do whatever. I'll fuck it. I, don't, I don't care. I don't care. I'm not too proud. That's another thing that I think is, this, the, the, I think is fascinating about this generation. They're, you know, the, the idea of them having some manual labor job or doing something is just, oh my God, that's just beneath me. You know, oh, like I'll tell you right now, I went and my mother had, a, she had a house cleaning service with my Aunt Debbie. And by house cleaning service, I meant that the two of them went and cleaned people's houses. Because <laughs> the term house cleaning service might lead you to believe there was a, some type of business uh, 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 with multiple employees. Uh, no, my mom and my aunt went and cleaned people's homes. And that's how they made money. And I would go to make extra money. I would go with my mom or my mom, maybe one of their, because they would have usually one other helper with them. Sometimes that person called in sick and my mom would be like, hey, could you come help me? And I would go clean houses with my mom. Yeah, people's toilets. I would go clean other people's toilets and change their sheets and make their beds. I was, I don't know, I, I, I was... 18, 19, I, I can't remember anymore how old I was. So maybe I was also 16, 17, I was, I was young. But there I was, cleaning a house with my mom and dad. And so for any of these kids to act like they're fucking too good, to, I'm like, you little fuck, what the fuck, what do you know? What do you know? If you, you, you know, it's like I find, I find some of these, some, some people just, just, uh, just, their, their mentality, what they think is beneath them. And I'm like, you know, there was, you know, I was, I was raised a Christian. Most of you guys know that, which is why I'm such an atheist. So I was going to say that at this point, one of my favorite things, but I love, I love me some Jesus. I'm going to tell you honestly, I, I, love, uh, I love me some JC because I, I love a lot of the things that uh, uh, were, uh, you know, that, that were written supposedly that, that, that uh, he said. So whether he said them or not or whatever, but there's a lot of, a lot of great material that comes out of, out, of, uh, out of the New Testament. But one of my favorite things that he said in there was, before you can be the master, you must first be the servant. Now that, is the kind of shit I never forget. I never forget that stuff. And to this day, that's me. I, I'm, I mean, I'm built by it. I know, I know it's part of my, my internal structure of, of you know, I, you, you can't help but, you know, be what, what built you in some way. And so I was certainly built on the back of, of, of biblical philosophy, <laughs> somehow and and so but you know and that's just one of the things that I took away which 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 I think is incredible and it made a huge difference for me uh, like embodying that and keeping that that there's no I, I, there's nothing I'm too good to do you know when when I can remember one time in my school, the toilets overran and there's shit all over the floor. Shit water is running all over the school in Miami, the, the academy. And you know who's cleaning it up? Me. I got the bucket. I got the mop. It was me and another kid. And I remember us both standing in that shit water <laughs> being like, this is a sh really shitty job. Literally, no pun intended at, at, at that in any way. It was truly shitty in every way. But... It's like, hey, it's my business, it's my responsibility, and it ain't, and I, there's nothing that's beneath me. And I still have that attitude to this day. So be willing to do whatever it takes. That's number two for me. So one, moving, you know, be in the direction of your gifts to do whatever it takes to, you know, to, to, to raise yourself up 
and get wherever you need to go. So as I started to figure out how to make money, and I use the word wealth a lot because I like the word wealth. Money doesn't mean anything to me. It's just it's like, oh, I got some money. Well, no, I have some wealth. Wealth is a more powerful term for me. So I use that term, you might notice quite often, um, over the word money. So as I build my wealth, as I started to learn how to build wealth, there was something that was still lagging behind for me. And that was matching my talent in what I was, what I, my offering, my, my product, my service, matching that with what I was charging for it. So for a long time, I had an issue with asking for what I was worth. And I'm sure you guys can relate to that. There are always people, I, I, I don't, I bet you every teacher I talk to struggles with this, asking for their worth. So many people I know struggle to ask for their worth. And it's difficult, especially if you don't come from wealth. When you don't come from wealth, you really don't know what you're worth because you've never even had the conversation around the exchange of money, my time, what is my time worth? Well, when, I've, when I come from the bottom, when I start on the bottom, I, you know, what, how do I define or determine my own wealth? It's difficult. Can, can everyone sort of uh, relate to that in some way? It's tough. Um, so consider that for a moment, how, how, how complex that could be. Um, it, it reminds me of like, say, a young person who didn't grow up with a, a father or a mother or someone in their life that told them that they were special, they were worth something, that they, that they mattered, that they were going to be whoever they wanted to be. If, if they didn't grow up hearing that, how would they know to even think that way? And so it really does matter, you know, from an early age, what we're told, what we're taught. So I, I wasn't taught anything about wealth. So I didn't know how to place that, you know, accurate value on my wealth. So I did something and, I, and, 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 and I'm going to argue that this is still a smart strategy. I gave a lot away a lot of my time. I did a lot of shit for free. I did a lot of stuff at low, at low prices. I, I, I hustled. I took, you know, I took, I took jobs and I definitely, I definitely undervalued myself at that time. And I even knew, um, I knew I wasn't making what I thought I was worth but I also was not willing to turn away work. I was, I, it was like, it, I'm, I'm an opportunist as well. Who, think about that for a moment. Who on this call right now considers themselves an opportunist? Because I, I'm an opportunist. An opportunist is someone who takes advantage of an opportunity. There's a moment that shows up and you go, and you recognize that it is an opportunity and you say, I'll do that. <laughs> That's me, sure, I got it. That's the kind of individual that I am. Um, I'll give you an example, let me tell you, do you like my stories? I, I don't know if you like them or not, but I'm gonna keep telling them, because <laughs> they're the only way, <laughs> my stories are the only way I can tell you things to make points. So sorry if, if you're like, ah, another story. But they're, they are the metaphor, you know, they're the way I get you to the, th that's how I experience these lessons is through the story. So story. Some of you guys know that I train Lovato, Rafael Lovato Jr., who won 
the Bellator middleweight world championship against Musasi in mixed martial arts. Now this is a very prestigious title because next to the UFC, Bellator is the second largest and most successful promotion in the world. Rafael, I was, you know, I, I, I am, was, I mean, we just haven't fought in a while, but we're on the team that won that world title. Myself amongst a few other guys who do different things. Mine, my work is recovery, mobility. Um, how did I get that job? How did I become the movement coach for the world champion? I was looking through videos on YouTube because I was doing some, my first job with this was with Josh Bergman, UFC fighter. He came to do a Budokan yoga teacher training and we became close and he hired me as his movement coach. And I was doing some research for him as you do for your fighters to, to see who they're fighting and what their style is like and what you sort of want to plan for. And I came across Rafael randomly because I think he was fighting a, a, a person that Josh was, had already, uh, was about to fight. He'd already fought them. And I started watching him move and I was like, this guy's got a very interesting movement, way of moving. And I became interested, I, I Got, I found his website. I sent him an email via his info. If you go on a website, you know, not even a personal email. This was an email that was sent to his business. It said, like, send an email for inquiries. I just, you know, filled out the boxes. And I said, hi, my name's Cameron Shane. <laughs> I'd like to be, I mean, this is true, true, absolutely. You know, just like, da, da, da. So here I am. Uh, I'm already at this point successful in my own right. I already do what I do and I'm already, I already make uh, a very good living. I don't need to do this. This is, but my, my, one of my, one of my dreams, one of my imagining, my, my, my imaginings is that I'm going to be on a team with a world champion in MMA. That's one of my goals. So I write him. I send this, and it just so happens that his strength coach has been following me and my work for years. So when Rafael says, this guy reached out to me who's interested in working with me in mobility. His name's Cameron Shane. Do you know him? And his strength coach, Luke, says, oh, yeah, I follow him. He's completely legit. This would be brilliant. And voila, just from taking the opportunity to reach out on a random, just again, his business site. I didn't have his personal email. He didn't know me. We didn't know each other. That is, an ex you know, and, and then from there, boom, two years later, we win a world title. And, and these, and then he becomes, of course, one of my mentors and he's my teacher in jujitsu and Shanji, who is also, who's his BJJ coach. So opportunists, opportunities, take advantage. Don't ever be afraid to ask for something. Don't ever be too proud. I wasn't too proud to reach out to this guy and say, hey, could I be your coach in this? Would, would you be interested? And by the way, oh, let me, let me, because there was a reason I was telling you this story. It wasn't just that. It was that I've never been paid a dime for that. I've never been paid a single penny for being his movement coach. I've never asked for a single penny. I have flown myself to every event that he, every fight he had, I flew myself there. I paid for every bit of it. The only time I did not pay for flying myself somewhere was the world title, which 
they paid for his team. But every other moment I paid for. So I paid to be his mobility coach. <laughs> so when you, when you think to yourself, how good, how, you know, you're too good to do this and to do that. I want you to, I want you to just think back on the story where I actually paid to earn the trust of this person until he was like, you know, this guy, yeah, he, he's legit. Because look, this guy had already been, he's a world champion. He'd already been training for years and years. He already had a team. He doesn't need me. He doesn't know me. I had to earn that. And when after he saw me putting all my hard work, my time, my money into being there for him, and I was very honest with him. I said, I want to win a world title with you. This is one of my dreams, and I think I can do it with you. I think you can be a world champion in MMA. And I said, that's, that, so that's, why, that's my why with you. I was very honest with him and very upfront. I, you know, it was never, it was always very clear. And that, that relationship has been a huge change in my life. It, it, made a big, it just made a big difference for me. But it was all my personal effort. So I was never too good to turn down something. And I, and I was never afraid to take, you know, take advantage of an opportunity and, and go for it and whatever it, what, at whatever it cost to do it. Once I was able to start creating wealth, there were a few things that I got really clear on really fast that are very important to me. As, because I own a business, so number one, any dollar that goes out of this business needs to come back $1.50. $2, $3, it doesn't matter, but it needs to come back either, it needs to pay for itself, or it needs to come back plus some. So whatever you invest in yourself or your business, make sure that money always returns. So if, let's say you have to hire an employee, because we often get asked, hey, do you have jobs? Do you have a job for, you know, is there any, are there any openings? Could, could, you know, do you need a social media manager? Yada, yada, yada. Here's the, here's the way that I look at investing into people or investing into, em, an, in, into an employee, quote unquote, is that whatever I put into them, they have to generate that plus profit. You understand? It just, it has to be that way. I can't put a dollar into someone or something and it just disappears. It has to be that the dollar goes in and the dollar comes back. And if that dollar happens to have another dollar with it, I'm winning. Does that make sense? So whatever you're doing with your wealth, you make sure whatever, again, and, and this, is not, this is not some abstract idea. If I take a seed, a tomato plant, I take a seed and I plant it in the soil, I'm expecting that seed to come up and sprout and produce. And if I take one, how many, how many tomatoes does one plant yield? A lot. Just, let's just say plenty. One tomato plant yields many tomatoes. That's one seed. One seed produced multiple fruits. That's how I see a dollar. A dollar goes in and it needs to produce more than one dollar. Does that make sense? Don't put your money into, and, and this is, this is, this is uh, there's another way of saying this, and, and it's a little bit more academic, it's a little bit more specific to finance. It's asset versus liability. 
Assets are things that make you money, and liabilities are things that cost you money. If you want a pony for fun, that is a liability. You're going to have to pay for the pony. You're going to have to pay for the food for the pony. You're going to have to pay for a stall. You're going to have to pay vet bills. You're going to have to pay all the shit that, that, you know, that comes along with owning a pony. And that is why it's called a liability because you're liable <laughs> for all the costs that are associated to that possession, right? An asset makes you money. So do you use that pony for children's birthday parties and it, that you rent that pony out for a thousand dollars a party? Well, now you spend $500 on the pony, but the pony generates $1,000 a month. So you're $500 in profit with that pony. So that is called an asset, <laughs> right? Financial, you know, just it's so basic, right? It's so basic. But I, I ask each of you, you better ask yourself the question of how much do you put into liabilities and how much do you put in assets? Because that cup of coffee you drink every morning, that's $4 and $5, that's a liability. That doesn't make you money. Coffee does not make you money. Coffee does not make you money. It costs you money. All the little delicious shit you eat doesn't make you money. It costs you money. All of your little habits that are your pleasures it costs you money. It doesn't make you money. So you better decide, you know, again, where you want to put your wealth and make sure it's coming back. Okay? Does this make sense? And I know it, again, it seems like rudimentary financial advice, but it's not because people oftentimes have these massive blind spots in their wealth management. Simple things. They don't understand that it's not okay to just simply spend money on pleasures. And someone goes, well, my God, what kind of life do you want to live if you can't enjoy yourself? No, no, no. You see, there's the entire... basis of that question is is corrupt it's incorrect the real question is why can't you learn to be happy with less why can't you learn to enjoy and get pleasure from simple nothingness why do you always have to be constantly using your wealth to get these little hits of pleasure because you can't sort of manage or temper your palate. So the real, the real work is not in, well, I'm just gonna make more money so I can buy more bullshit. Or you could learn to be less interested and less turned on by bullshit and use the wealth you didn't spend on that to then start accumulating more wealth because again, mathematically, the more wealth you have, the easier it is to make more wealth and that's just the way it goes. It grows exponentially. So $2,000 doesn't grow as fast as $4,000. It doesn't grow as fast as $6,000. So as you start stacking wealth, it starts exponentially growing. So you learn to temper all of these pleasures that you keep feeding and learn to actually be happy with basic things. I eat super, super simple I eat very well. I eat very good, clean food, but I'm not, but every time we get someone who comes to the house and they, because, uh, you know, we hold all of our events and we'll have chefs that come and the, the chefs, you know, so, so what do you eat? And they can't wrap their head around the fact that all I want is sweet potatoes, rice, 
<laughs> like I, I, I have no, they, they, you know, they're, they're, there's all, don't you want all this? And I'm like, no, I, that's not what I eat. I, I eat, I eat for fuel, not for pleasure. You know, I eat for fuel. I'm not addicted to food and I'm not addicted to it being, you know, it's a, again, another addiction for humans. We're addicted to, a, to our palate, to our pleasures. So learning to really, and again, I don't feel I'm missing out. So some people will be like, man, you're really missing out. No, I'm not. I'm actually super happy because I'm not addicted to what you're addicted to. That's like a heroin addict looking at me and saying, man, you are missing out on that fucking high. That, that heroin high is so good. And I'm like, yeah, my sober high is really good. I don't need to be high on heroin, even though I'm, I'm glad you're enjoying that. But I'm, I'm really happy where I'm at. So I've learned to be sober and be super fucking stoked in sobriety. I don't need to be drunk. I don't need to be hot. I'm, I don't need to be stuffing my face with the most delicious, you know, complex meals. I, I, I'm really happy, but I've learned to do that. And you have to learn to do that if you want to be skillful, conserve your wealth, conserve it to then use it skillfully. Now, there are things that I, I spend money on that, you know, uh, you, you come in the house and you're like, you know, I mean, I, I put money, I put wealth into, if you come, when you, when you come here, because I know at some point you guys will end up here at the Montana, I think if you've ever witnessed anything I build, if you came to Miami or if you come here, you'll notice that, you know, we spend money on our, on our brand. So if it's the clothing, if it's our home, if it's the academy, we put money into that because I want to create a premium experience. But again, every dollar I put into that premium experience comes back because I also, and this is, this is um, something that Mulane is very good at. Uh, we also ask for, or we ask to be paid what we equally put in. Mulane's very good at that. She's better at that than I am. I still try to give everything away. <laughs> Melaine's like, nope. And I, I, I just celebrate the German in her. It's like, nope, that's not going to happen. You know, and uh, she's very good at holding the line on that. She's very good at asking for the worth, for your worth, asking for what you've put in. We put in a lot to make the experience extraordinary for people. And so there is an equal ask in return. Um, perfect example, you know, uh, the Budokan Online membership is, if you, if you have the full membership, is, uh, was it 49 a month? Yes. It's $49 a month. Well, that is m more, that's significantly more than most online platforms. What, what do you think the sweet spot of an online platform is financially? Su the sweet spot, the, the, that perfect place to be. It's $19.99. It's $15.99. Anywhere between $15 and $19 is the sweet spot if you want to be commercially successful and have as many people as you can get. But, I, but we charge $49 because we we hold the belief that what we offer is worth more than $19.99 a month. We hold the position that our work is more valuable than that and the time we put into our students and the time we put into our curriculum and into our technology, into our, it's, it's worth more than that. So we, that's, that's the end of that, that's how it goes. And I don't care if I don't get all those people who are going, well, I wouldn't pay that. I wouldn't pay more than $19. And you know what? You're, you're, and you are about a $19 a month mover. That's how I see it. 
that's about what you're worth. That's about, that's about what you should ask. But matter of fact, you should also then ask to get paid what you're willing to put into other people's work too. So you should also ask for $19 a month for your private lessons and your, you know what I mean? Like, no way. And I mean, that's, and that's what we're, we're talking about. We're talking about you, if you're not willing to put wealth into something, don't expect to ask for wealth to come back to you. Don't expect it. So that's how it goes. You can decide for yourself, you know, what things are worth or not worth. But, you know, and, and but the whole Budokan experience, that's what it's worth to us. And we're not going to change that. Now, we have other options on the website. You can have a yoga-only membership or a mobility-only membership. You know, it's fine. But if you want the entire Budokan experience, this is what it's worth. So, you know, you decide how you're going to, you know, because again, in my opinion, if you take one Sunday session and one Sunday session, if you really show up here and you listen and you focus and you pay attention and you take notes, mental, physical, you, 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 you sit down and become a real fucking student you're going to take some stuff away that's going to make a difference for you. And then you tell me if that's worth $50 a month. <laughs> you, 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 decide, you decide how much one gem, one emerald, one ruby of wisdom and knowledge and that you can take, embody, and apply. Is that worth $50? That's how you have to think about it. Because it's all up to you. Because the person who doesn't really get much out of this platform doesn't know how to use the platform. If you know how to use the platform, you sit down, you pay attention, and you get into school. We're in school. And you guys, the guys who really show up here, you're good at, you are very good at being students. And great students become great teachers. Because they know how to learn so that's how it goes. So coming back to, you know, asset and liability, this is an asset for you if you use it to make money. If you spend $50 a month here and you don't do anything with it, it's a liability, period. And you should let it go because uh, it's not worth much to you. It's, it's simply costing you money. But if you know how to use it, it's an asset. So every $50 you put into this a month should be producing well over that. But that's up to you. How do you use it? How do you use the resource? Don't expect a check to show up in your mailbox, you know. No. <laughs> so... Um, I think that's uh, that's a that's a good starting you know it's, it's, it's a good starting point for the conversation of asset and liability, and 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 once you figure out the difference between the two, then you start figuring out with your accumulated wealth how to save wealth, how to not spend all your money on pleasures but to start investing your money into your business. And that's what we do with our money. We put all of our money always, it all, all of our money continuously goes back into our business all the time, all the time. It doesn't go to a $5,000 vacation because in your mind, oh, I wonder, you know, what, what, like other people, what do you do with your wealth? It's like, well, I can tell you this, we don't take $5,000 and go to Fiji. Now you might say, man, you're, Missing life, nope, I will put, I, I would not do that. Now, again, I'm not like everybody, so my attitude about that is I would take $5,000 and put it into an educational experience. I would go somewhere and plan a workshop series. I would plan a workshop series in Fiji <laughs> and pay for me to be there. But I would not go and just piss away $5,000 so I could lay in the fucking sun. I mean, I'm just, that's how it goes for me. I, 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 you know, I would not do it. 
And that, to me, is how I have accumulated wealth and am living in a situation where I feel financially sustainable and I feel financially solid and there is wealth coming into the business that again keeps being put back in the business because again um, every time a, a little bit of money comes in I improve as an example we have two homes here I'm always putting money back into the land and into the homes I want better as an example when we first got here I bought for the guest the student houses I bought, there, there are uh, bunk beds in the rooms, so the students, you know, stay together. And we bought uh, duvets and sheets and everything for the beds. And then uh, a little while after, I said, okay, this was good, but let's, let, you know, as money, you know, again, spend some, wait till more comes in. Everything's got to be in balance. So as more came in, I said, okay, let's upgrade the beds and let's put these very nice uh, Pendleton covers on the beds because I want the students to have this beautiful, I want it to be pretty when they come in, I want them to have nice uh, quilts. So invested in the quilts that go on the beds. Then go in, okay, now, now we're gonna also upgrade this. So it's constant upgrading. And that's for the students. I don't get anything out of that. You know, that's not for me. I don't buy a Ferrari. I don't go, okay, money's come in. Now it's time to get the Ferrari I always wanted. No, I just keep, Melaine and I will just keep putting the money back in to the improvement of the space for the student experience. Because the money comes back. That's an asset. Because it makes money. People come and they go, wow, this is fucking beautiful. This is an amazing, wow. I love and you know what? That is an investment. They'll come back. They'll tell the next person, wow, what a beautiful place. What, well, you know, so da, 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 da. You, you get it. So all our money continuously goes back into improving the experience for the customer, quote unquote. Not for just serving our pleasures. You with me? Does this make sense? Okay, good. So this is, this is just a really straightforward way of learning how to go from zero, which is where I started, nothing. Do you know how much money that I had when I started Budokan? You know how much I had? That much. I had no money in savings. I had no college degree. I had no parents that had any money. I started with a $2,000 credit card. I had a credit card that, 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 that had a $2,000 limit on it. I have an American Express card right now that has no limit on it. <laughs> I'll tell you a story. I love it. I'm sorry. Another story. You ready? Boom. I'm in Costa Rica. Melaine and I are in Costa Rica. We're at a coffee shop. Following? We're at a coffee shop. The girl at the coffee shop charges, I, I hand her my American Express card. She accidentally charges my card. She says, do you want it in U.S. dollars or in Costa Rica? And I said, U.S. dollars is fine. She charges my U.S., my, my card, $25,000 for a coffee. <laughs> this is a true story. I'm not making it up. She hands me the receipt. I look at the receipt. I shit my pants. I go, what the fuck? <laughs> I mean, literally. I mean, I say that. I'm not kidding. I'm like, holy shit balls. This is $25,000. I look at the receipt. I go, I go uh, my dear, I think you just charged me $25,000. And, you know, her manager comes over and he's like, oh, my God. I mean, you know, the whole, the place is you know, losing its shit because this is like never, you know, oops. And so that was the most expensive cappuccino I've ever had in my life. Uh, so <laughs> the, point I, the point of this, by the way, I got, I got my coffee and my breakfast for free that day uh, just because that was, you know, and that was the right customer service. It was very good. Um, so I went from having a credit card that has a $2,000 limit on it to having a credit card that does not have a limit on it. I can literally go and buy a fucking Ferrari with it if I wanted. Now, do I? No. 
Of course not. You already know how fiscally conservative I am. But the fact that a company looks at my financial records and says, this guy's trustable enough to give him a credit card that has no limit on it. That's what, that's just simply the point I'm trying to make is that I'm that fucking responsible. I'm a financial fucking ninja, okay? I'm a, that, that's the whole point I'm trying to make. I am precise with our money. I'm conservative and Malayne is the little, the little brilliant German engineer behind it all. Aren't you, boo? She's a little... It's a little, little. What's the name of, of Donald Duck's uncle? Yeah, screw you're like yeah. She's like Donald Duck's uncle, the the one who was very conservative with money. That's Malane. So, you think I'm conservative? She's more conservative. But here's what Malane does. It's amazing. I, I want to say, she gives people scholarships. She works out finances for people all the time. Do you know how many students that we have worked with financially that, that, that came to a training that did not pay full, like the, 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 it, the, you know, the price that we feel this education is worth, I can't tell you how many times we have helped a person to pay what they could afford to pay. So there's another thing that has never left me, which is helping people, no matter where they are at financially, I'm not gonna turn a person away from our work because of money. We'll figure it out. I don't know what, we'll trade services, I don't know what we'll do, but we'll figure it out. But I've never turned a person away because of money. And if you've paid 100% of your fee before, then thank you for helping somebody else who couldn't pay 100% of theirs because you contributed to somebody else. So in, a, in, in essence, everybody keeps contributing to each other in some way, shape, or form. Those who have a little more, you help those who have a little less at the time because at some point, those who have a little less will have a little more. They'll help somebody who has a little less. You keep doing that and you'll keep producing beautiful shit in the world. Beautiful things will be produced with that attitude and that mentality. And, it will, and all that will return because that's an investment. And I believe in investing in people. I do. So I think that's a pretty good, you know, pretty good sort of take on the overall concept. I told you, you know, I started the business with $2,000 on a credit card. So that means I didn't even have $2,000. I borrowed $2,000 from the bank. But, to, you know, you can, you can start from nothing and build something. But you know what I did? Here's a question for you. Do you know what I did with the first $2,000 that, that I borrowed? You're, yes, I hired a hooker. no. I, that was not the first thing I did with the 2000, even though I saw some of your faces. You thought, oh, he went out and partied and got in bought sex. No. What I did with that $2,000 was I invested into posters. Because at the time, I was training Courtney Cox and Jennifer Aniston. And that was my real like asset. I had these two well-known women that I was, their, I was their personal trainer. I produced posters, full color, big posters that I could send to yoga studios. I, I created a tour and I went out there. Nobody knew who I was. No, I had no name. There was no, no, no notoriety in any way, shape or form. Budokan was just a, a word I, was, I had invented. And I set up a tour. I sent these posters to each of these workshops and each of these uh, venues. And the, the, they hung the poster up and it was like a picture of me doing this thing. And then it had quotes on it from Courtney and Jennifer. And it was like, and that's how I, that's how I got people to be interested in coming to my workshop. So I spent $2,000 on those posters. 
and then the rest to help me fly to go. And that's how I did it. I got out on the road and I toured and nobody knew who I was and nobody knew my name. And I just hustled my ass off. And I went from workshop to workshop and I toured for 10 years like that. 10 years of traveling on the road and doing workshops at studios where there would be 10 people. My first teacher training had two people in it. Two people in it. First teacher training, two people. And you know how I taught those people? The same way I teach 20 people. The same way I teach 40 people. With the same passion and the same attitude. Because that's why I have 40 people to teach is because I taught two people the same way I taught 40 people. I fucking rocked those two people's worlds. They were like, fuck, this guy's legit. And I'm like, you're damn right. I, I'm serious about teaching. And I'm going to turn you into incredible movers and they can't and then they told two people and they told two people and they told two people and you know and it's this is it this is how it's done so you have to be willing again to always put your money back into your business back into your craft to produce more And if you don't love your craft and your business and, and, and your workplace, then you're doing it all wrong. I love my job. I love going to work. I love what I do. And therefore, it's never worked for me in that way. It's never a burden. Sometimes I'm like, oh, fuck. I, you know, I prefer this over that. This maybe that. But I always love my work. And therefore, I'm never really going to work. And I'm never bitter about putting money into my work because I love what I do. And it is where I want my money to be. And therefore, it's just this beautiful ecosystem that just feeds itself. And that's it. That's my conversation, or at least my at least the, 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 my two cents, my little bit of my experience, a little bit of my advice, um, my take on building wealth, maintaining wealth, sort of these little things. Make sure you save. Save your money, invest your money. Save your money, invest your money. Remember, Jesus saves but Moses invests, and that's the difference, okay? Just in case you're confused. And this is what my business coach said to me, who is Jewish. <laughs> He's one of my good buddies. He said, Cameron, you're raised Christian, right? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, you just remember this. Jesus saves, but Moses invests. And I thought, God, that's so fucking brilliant, and I love it. And to this day, I still use that. So, some people, some people save, but some people invest. So, I save less than I invest. I, all, I mean, saving's good, but, I'm, but, in, but when I invest in something, it's usually yielding and producing more wealth. So, I'll tend to invest into something that produces more wealth than just sit my money under my mattress and go, oh, I hope that makes me more money. How's it going to make me more money sitting under my fucking mattress? Right? How's that going to happen? So you have to believe in yourself by putting money into yourself. Okay? Um, so you guys can read through the... Um, you can read through the comments. There's a bunch of different things that people were saying. There's some good stuff in there. Make sure you get in there and, and check some of that out. There's always good comment. Always good comments coming through. So check those out. I see a lot of stuff people are writing. That's good stuff. Okay, guys. I'm going to let... Uh, I'm 22 minutes over. So I'm going to let Melaine take over. It's time for some movement. So take some... Take a moment. Take a break. Get some water, do your business, come back. It's time to move. I love you guys. I appreciate you so much. Thank you so very much for your attention and your studentship. And as always, uh, it's, I'm just so grateful for each of you guys and how, 
how much you 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 support and pay attention. I really do appreciate it because I can see your faces. I know you see, you think of it, but I see you. I see you when you're just like this. I see when your face is like and you're like this. I see that. I can see all, all your little squares of all you guys. And then I can also see when you're doing like this, when you're going, hey, Bob, hey, um, you, you're in the kitchen. Yeah, make me something. You know, I can see that too, by the way. So, you know, when you're fucking off on, on camera, you think I don't see that. Of course, I see that too. So, you know, try, try your best to, you know, tune in. All right, love you guys. See you later.